I definitely know I'm not from Earth. Like, I fucking know that. I've been saying that forever. <laughs> cool. All right. So, post some technical difficulties. Basically, we are talking about how quarantine is going. You're telling us some things that were helpful for you. You want to give us those again? Yes. Um, so, some things that have been helpful for me during this time have been um, one, just being outside in nature. Um, I, like I said, I'm living at my mom's house right now. Um, and we just have access to a lot of acreage. And so it's, um, like, I know I'm very privileged to have that, but it's been, um, something that I'm really, really grateful for because my nervous system has felt super dysregulated and, um, it just makes me like hurt for people who are in worse situations than I am because I feel crazy and like crap <laughs> and really anxious. And yeah. so, um, yeah, I just really can't imagine how this is affecting other people. So it's very, very devastating. Um, so yeah, nature, I've been doing a lot of yoga, um, and then just creating art, um, like art that I don't have to post on Instagram, even though that's super uncomfortable because <laughs> I don't know how to, yeah. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do things like for leisure, you know? So it's just very weird. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of us don't know how to do that, which is why that's the good side of this is that we're forced to explore those things, which is, yeah, yeah good for us, I think. Cool. Well, you want to share with us um, your your story of who you are and how you got here and, yeah, what the story of you is so we can all know a little more about Emma. Yeah. Um. So I feel like whenever people ask me this question, <laughs> there's like, 10 different things I could talk about. Um, I like was in a religious cult and that's a whole nother story. Um, I have a lot of childhood trauma. We can dig into that. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a lot of childhood trauma. Um, I have trauma with my dad. I have trauma with my mom. I have trauma with men. Like I have a lot of shit. Um, so I guess basically long story short, I'm from Kansas originally. Um, and grew up in a small Midwestern town right outside of Kansas city. And, um, I guess, I mean, it's kind of, it feels small to me, even though it's like literally 50,000 people. So I guess it's really not that small in the context of other towns. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, my family was <clears throat> very privileged. We have a lot of socioeconomic privilege. I'm white. Um, we had money. We had both of my parents own, my mom used to own a state farm agency. My dad owns, um, my dad still owns till this day, a car dealership that has been in our family for three generations. Um, and so with that, yeah, I grew up with, with money and I always had anything that I needed and wanted. Um, but also on the flip side, there is a lot of very, very covert psychological abuse that happened in my family. A lot of um, very much malignant narcissism <laughs> that was very hard to detect. Um, and so on the outside, we were this perfect white talented, attracted Midwestern family that probably looked like we had the American dream. And on the inside, um, my mom had four suicide attempts. My dad was cheating on her all the time with younger women. Okay. I shouldn't technically say all the time. That's a little bit exaggerated, but he had multiple, <laughs> multiple affairs with, um, younger women and a lot of just a lot of shit, um, a lot of physical abuse and things like that. And so basically I started waking up for lack of better words, to all of this when I was about 21, 22 years, I guess between like 20 and 22. Um, and so everything that I really thought was wrong with me, like for example, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when I was 16 and I suffered from horrible anxiety and panic attacks and um, just really obsessive, compulsive, addictive behaviors. And I used to think that, especially because I was in religion, I thought that I was just like a piece of shit. <laughs> you know, I didn't really know what was wrong with me. And we had a family therapist who also gaslit me and my mom a lot. Um, and we, I would go to her and be like, I'm so depressed. I'm so suicidal. And she would be like, well, like, um, have you been spending time with Jesus lately? And <laughs> mm -hmm. so I also, that's another part of my story. I have abuse from the, um, medical system. If you, I guess, I mean, she's a psychiatrist, so she could, that is technically medical, I guess she could, um, diagnose and, um, prescribe me drugs. And so, um, yeah, back to, I like back to what I was saying, I guess from ages 20 to 22, I've just been waking up to everything that I thought was wrong with me was really just ways that I adapted to my environment in order to survive, um, and realizing that just a lot of what my reality was um, 
wasn't. And a lot of parts of my childhood and my life and my family were very much illusions. And so Mm -hmm. it's like, I've swallowed so many fucking red pills at this point that I'm like, (laughs) nothing is real. Like, so basically, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's been crazy. I feel like I've been in my own version of the matrix. Um, so yeah, um, long story short, now I sort of help, um, folks who, have similar stories to mine and who have a lot of trauma that I usually, I typically work with people who have already been in trauma therapy just because I'm not a therapist. Um, and there's only so there's, I can only go so deep with folks because I'm not, I'm not trained. Um, and so, yeah, I, I write a lot about it. I write, I coach people on it and I just help people like wake up from the shit that they've been dealt for lack of better words. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I feel like there's that's an important role too, like the writers and the coaches, you know, it kind of fills in a different piece as someone who's worked with therapists a lot in my life and my sister's a therapist and also being a writer and someone who talks about mental health and all of these things online, those I think can work together really well and help. I've, I've had a lot of people tell me that and therapists thank me because their clients can come in more informed and like they read something and that resonates with them and then they're like, oh, I think this is me and then it helps their therapy go a little deeper and so I think all of that is important and that work that you do is is amazing and so great and you write so beautifully and it's really awesome (laughs) thank you I appreciate that and yeah I would say the same to you like we really do need all hands on deck (laughs) on planet earth right now like this place is uh beautiful but kind of a shit show (laughs) you know and so I think we really do need all the people that are waking up from their stories um not even if they're talking about it publicly but just like letting other folks know that they're not alone you know and um there there's no shame I feel like there's a lot of shame especially when it comes to family Mm -hmm. trauma it's very much like a taboo topic that not a lot of people um feel comfortable talking about rightfully so because all these systems I like to call them like thrive in in secrecy you know and in denial and shoving things under the rug and I got so tired of that (laughs) yeah yeah definitely yeah I always like say that my biggest things that I if I could just get everybody to understand like the basis of what my core message is it's that it's okay to feel all your feelings even the scary bad ones and that wherever you are is perfectly okay. And that to just accept that, to accept yourself and to accept everything that you're experiencing and to feel it all. And that I, as someone who also has come from a religious background, like a Christian religious background, and then moved into kind of the spiritual world there, even in that, I found a lot of like, just moving towards this destination, this, whether it was enlightenment or whatever you want to call it, like, or higher levels of consciousness. It's like, there's always somewhere else to be something, something that doesn't include all the mess that you're feeling or you're experiencing. And, um, I think it's just so important for people to understand. I I think we're all plagued with this, this, hatred towards our own selves and thinking that what we're experiencing or what we're feeling is not what a person should feel or a normal person or what it's what we're supposed to be like I wish I could just get rid of all the shoulds and supposed tos in the world because there is none like it's our it's your experience and like we all need to find what works for us so yeah I love that that's really beautiful and I would definitely agree I feel like those are some of my core messages too and then like another one is I like love to just tell people that they make sense (laughs) like the ways that they've like learned to cope and the ways that they've adapted and things like that like it doesn't have anything to do with morality or like right or wrong or good or bad like it just makes sense you know like if somebody tells me that they really have a lot of anxiety and then I get down to it and turns out like their parents got a divorce and they never process that or something like that. I'm like, it actually makes a lot of sense to me that you'd feel this way, you know? And they're like, yeah, it does make a lot of sense. Like I should be anxious or I should be pissed or whatever. So I like to, I like, I love that phrase. You make sense. (laughs) Yeah. Once we accept all that, we're like, okay, this is fine. Then that's when, in my experience, it starts to dissipate or become free from our bodies because if we're saying, oh, I shouldn't feel this or like that, then it just gets more and more trapped. And so I think a lot of the spiritual world or even the kind of mental health world can be very heady and like ideas of this is what I'm supposed to do or this is what I know I should be doing. But then your body is having a different experience. And so we have to 
sit with what is happening in the body, even if it doesn't match up with the ideas of who we think should be. But. Absolutely. And I feel like that's so um, just infiltrated into like the new age spiritual community. There's a lot of shame around um, like emotions in general yeah. and like yeah. emotions that are very appropriate and normal and like really beautiful just because like they may not feel as good as like joy or peacefulness or whatever like they're still important and they're still necessary and I'm sure we'll get into that in our conversation but like that yes. stuff really frustrates me and I write a lot about that so definitely I want to dig a little bit into narcissism because that's something that I've gotten a lot of questions about from people and a lot of people seem to have questions about it and not understand it or wonder if they're like I, I first started putting out some videos about narcissism because I also went through a situation with a narcissist kind of four people who were in a relationship with a narcissist and then I was so surprised I got so many messages from people being like am I a narcissist I'm like well I'm glad you're self-aware enough which probably means you aren't but it's good that you're asking this and so I wanted to dig in a little bit about what is narcissism how do we know if we're with somebody who's like that what do we do about it um so let's dive into that a little bit because I know you have a lot yeah yeah um so first and foremost like narcissism exists on a spectrum um and it's not all bad and it's um definitely like not a black and white thing like we we all need some narcissism um what some would call like the ego if we don't have any healthy if we have like zero healthy narcissism we're gonna have no self-esteem we're gonna not we're not gonna know how or when to put up boundaries with people um, and so it definitely exists on a spectrum. Um, it's just when you get to the higher end of the spectrum, that's when people, um, me and my mom sort of came up with the like four or five, um, like main, I guess, like characteristics of somebody who's a narcissist and I wrote them down. Um, and so we like wrote one lack of acknowledgement, like there's just zero lack of, or there's zero, um, concept of like acknowledging any wrongdoing or having any sense of self-reflection or anything like that. Um, and so typically people who are on the higher end of the narcissism spectrum, um, will project all of their shit back onto other people. And, um, yeah, so the first one is lack of acknowledgement. And the second one is like lack of empathy. Um, and it's hard because, again, it's not a black and white thing, but this, this usually comes from people's intuition. Um, and this is like what a lot of teachers who talk about narcissism, narcissism talk about where they're, where they're like, something just feels off with these, with these types of people. Like there's just something you, you may not like put a finger to it. You can't really conceptualize it, but like your body just knows that something is off. Um, and with that, like one of the people who's, um, on the higher end of the spectrum that I know, like would kind of, um, demonstrate their lack of empathy with like, um, if I told them that something that hurt me, they'd be like, well, that's not my problem and things like that. And so very much just, um, yeah, lack of empathy is really the only way to describe it. Um, and then lack of accountability is the second one where again, they just gaslight you and project all their stuff back onto you. And there's no, um, there's no conceptualization of that. They could ever be wrong about anything. Um, mm. and then the last one we wrote, we wrote down is no amended behavior. Um, now with, with all of these things that it gets really tricky because a lot of narcissists know what to say and when to say it. And so they could know when to apologize because they know that like in a, in a perfect world, that's what they're supposed to do. So they can have something that's like called cognitive empathy. Um, when they like, it's almost like they study like, like, um, Hallmark movies or whatever. I forget what that, um, channel is called with all like the soap opera mo lifetime. <laughs> they like study. Oh, yeah, yeah. They like study lifetime movies. So they like know exactly like I'm supposed to apologize right here. So they'll be like, I'm sorry, but like not mean anything by it. Um, and so, yeah, lack of acknowledgement, um, the gaslighting, the pushing things back on you, the always blaming other people. They're like chronic victims. They have zero sense of accountability at all. The lack of empathy, that's when like there's just something off with this person. You can't put a finger on it. Um, 
the lack of accountability and then no amended behavior where like they may apologize for something, but like if you, they may change for like two days, but sooner or later it's going to be back on their same bullshit. Um, and with this, it can get so confusing because people can be overt narcissists like Donald Trump. The dude's totally an overt narcissist, but where it gets really, really tricky is like Ted Bundy or somebody like that, where they're very covert and manipulative and like calculating and deceitful, if that makes sense. Um, and those are the types of narcissists that I've mostly dealt with, the covert ones. And it's very scary because <laughs> the psychological abuse and the covert gaslighting, um, it's, it's very insidious and in that like, it's sort of like an infectious disease that you keep drinking this poison, but you think that there's something wrong with you because they keep telling you that there is. And so before you know it, you're like really, really sick and you don't even understand what caused it. Um, and so that was sort of the dynamic, the dynamic that I grew up with in my family. Wow. So what would you recommend for somebody who's like, oh, I think this person in my life is a narcissist. What are some, what are some things that we can do to protect ourselves from that or be more aware? Yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to say like any concrete, um, black and white, like top five things to do, at least in, in my experience. Um, because oftentimes people are in relationships with narcissists and don't know. Um, my mom was, I mean, married to my dad for 30 years and my dad was very abusive. And, um, she, he also had a family that very much reinforced his abuse. And so my mom was isolated and scapegoated. And so it took her 30 years to realize that she was in a relationship with a narcissist. And a lot of women, I believe, who are labeled mentally ill or, or who like get into a relationship and then become a completely different person are being like, um, systemically like, um, isolated from themselves and gaslit and things like that. And so, Like, to be honest, I know this is a very general way of looking at things, but like when you feel that something is off with someone, like trust that, like just know that your intuition, your body does not lie to you. Your mind will lie to you all day long and you can try to be like, oh, but he said this and he said this. And like, I'm so confused because he says he loves me, but like he hits me or something like that. Like get out of your head and get into your body. And if your body like feels anxious as hell around these people, or again, like I said, just knows that something is off with them, your body's right. Your body is literally wired to protect you. Um, and so it's really, really important to listen to those, those impulses and those urges and those inklings that you have when you just freaking know that there's something off with someone. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great rule of thumb in general, because everything not one thing that might work for one person also may not work for someone else and the situations are always really different and I think that applies to just mental health in general because even these terms like you know you already said narcissism is a spectrum and so is anxiety and depression and like you talked about misdiagnosis of bipolar they're like all of these things like a diagnosis is for insurance purposes and billing purposes it's like drawing a circle around something and saying these things are kind of similar and we're going to call that this but there's so many different aspects to what causes something and why that symptom might be showing up and what it's tied to and so it's really important i think for us in all of this stuff is to just know even if you have like a medical diagnosis of something to be like, all right, this is complicated and that worked for that person, but it doesn't feel good to me. So trusting our intuition, trusting our inner voice, big, good Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love that you brought that up because I feel like for me, when I was in relationships with people, like when I was dating people who I um, thought were maybe on the higher end of the spectrum, like I would read like top five things that narcissists do. And like my boyfriend at the time would only fall under two of them. So I'd be like, Oh my God, I'm overthinking it, you know? And so like, I think those things can be useful, but like, I just get frustrated when it's like, if you're, if your boyfriend doesn't do, if your partner doesn't do this, then he's probably not a narcissist. And I'm like, that's not necessarily true because like you said, and like I brought up, it, it, it exists on a spectrum. And so to like box these things in can be really confusing for people. Like I know it was really, really confusing for me. Cause then I'd be like, Oh my God, he's right. I am crazy, you know? (laughs) 
Um, but with that, it, it does help to research also. And so again, it's like kind of a light and a dark side of that. There's just really no black and white answer. I can tell folks what has worked for me and if it works for them, then great. If it doesn't, then they can go find something else that, that better serves them. Yeah. So definitely. Um, I want to talk, you, you talk a lot about what you've kind of coined is, well, I don't know if you've coined this or, but the term of toxic positivity is what you, you yeah. mentioned. I'm curious to hear more about that. What is that? What do we do about it? Yeah. Um, again, not a black and white thing. Um, yeah. I should probably come up with like, I don't know, like a little diagram or something on how to identify if something is toxic positivity. But what I really look at it as is just a bypass of, of and a labeling of normal human emotions as bad or wrong. Um, and it's almost like trying to like slap up, but you should be grateful or like, but your situation isn't that bad or like, but other people have it worse or like, find the silver lining, like all those things that you see on like gift cards, you know, yeah. like kind of cheesy um, textbook things. And so I, it's very harmful because we, when we're not, when we're not allowed, sort of like we mentioned at the beginning of this call, like when we're not allowing ourselves and allowing other people to have the full spectrum of human emotion, it actually inhibits, if, if you're not allowing yourself to feel the sadness and to feel the grief and to feel all the things that like are really icky and uncomfortable, then you're actually inhibiting yourself from feeling the joy and from experiencing the goodness, you know, because in life yeah. with everything, there's a masculine feminine, there's a yin yang, there's a light and dark and to cancel out the dark, you're equally canceling out the light. Um, and so it's just important to have balance and it's important to like, not, I think, I guess at the end of the day, like really what it is, is it's just like slapping a bandaid on top of people's pain and telling them to smile their way through it. And I really hate it. <laughs> it's really frustrating. Yeah. And I had a lot of that in the religious spaces that I was in. Um, it's very damaging and it, and it, it sort of creates this shame where they're like, Oh, well, I guess they're happy all the time. So what's wrong with me? Like, I just need to get over it. And, um, it's just not helpful, yeah. you know, and it's really unhealthy. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. It's like, there's, I always say there's this resistance in forcing positivity sometimes that's like resisting a feeling. And so if you're pushing yourself towards that, then you're not in acceptance, you're in resistance. And so really accepting the whole of that and the non-dual nature of that, I think is super important. I'm seeing so much of that right now and less now than I was when all the quarantine corona stuff first started I was seeing like all the woo-woo hippies of the internet being like fear will make you sick don't be afraid and I was like okay that's I'm done with these I like made a video about it I'll send it to you I think you'll like it where I was just like fear we cannot shame our fear guys I was so over those messages yeah, so well, I think that's really important especially right now I think so too and like also if you look at it like biologically that's actually just not true like our nervous systems feel fear for a reason it's literally how our the like humanity has evolved this long like it's it's how our ancestors like didn't get eaten by tigers you know <laughs> like we need fear we need those um we need those impulses we need those alarm systems they literally help keep us alive um, and so it's like sort of back to what I mentioned about the narcissism. And that's why like I tell people to get out of their head and into their body. Um, and that's how like mindfulness and meditation and things like that can really help restore that mind body connection. That's often sort of, um, like thwarted because of trauma that we experience. So yeah, I want to watch your video. Yeah. You should definitely send it to me. Cause I like love this shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like getting so irritated at all that message about fear because that's like the big that was the big message about anxiety I made this video about anxiety that hit like two million views I don't know what it's at now but a lot but all it was saying it's like so simple but it was like your anxiety is just a mechanism that's trying to protect you like it's just adrenaline and all these things to give you energy and it, like all the studies show that people with anxiety are super empathetic, super intuitive, like very sensitive, beautiful people. And that system is a good system. Yours is just like a little overactive and maybe like setting off all the alarms when, you know, you're safe. And so saying like, oh, my anxiety, this is bad. I need to stop it is not what helps anxiety in my experience. It's it's saying, OK, like 
alarms are going off. It's communicating that something's up in my system. So it's like an, it's an invitation to listen, to be curious, not something to suppress or like shame. And so, and so many people are like, oh, thank you for this. And I feel like it's such a, like that hit such a chord in people. And I think that just goes to show how toxic the narrative of shaming these supposedly negative emotions of fear and anxiety is like so prevalent in our culture so that's so beautiful yeah I love the quote I don't even know who said it but what you resist persists like I'm sure you've heard that that's so true especially when it comes to to our emotions like you have to feel them in order to like let them go you know so I also came from a religious background. You said you came from a religious background and kind of moved into a space where you still use the term spirituality sometimes. So I'm curious to you to hear your or to hear your perspective about the difference between religion and spirituality, what is healthy, what is abusive. And again, I know all these things are not black and white. All of these things we could get into all the nuances and it's all going to be situation to situation, but I'm I'm curious to know a little more of your experience and of kind of moving out of a religious space but still integrating some aspects of what I haven't found any better word than spirituality for or but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that yeah so um I grew up in I would just probably call it like non-denominational Christianity um I did young life I don't know if you've ever heard of it um (laughs) yeah it's a youth group and to be honest the young life area that I grew up in um I, I, let me back up. I have some thoughts about Young Life as a whole because I know they're like very much anti-LGBTQ and that's just ridiculous. Um, and so I don't support Young Life at all. But I will say that the area that I grew up in is um, was really was really healthy for me. And it did um, just at least give me when my family was really crazy and my mom was really sick and things were really horrible at home. Like it gave me just a sense of community. Um, and I still talk to the leader that um, was like our area leader at the time. And I'm really grateful for those experiences, at least. Um, What really started (laughs) causing me to question my um, religious beliefs was um, I, when I was 19 or 19 or 20, I don't like, don't even remember now. I left um, college after two years and I decided to take a gap year and I was going to be a missionary um, at the, in this program called YWAM. And I was supposed to be living in Hawaii for six months and I was going to go overseas and do all these, probably now I would see them as very white saviorism ish (laughs) type of stuff. Um, And I raised like seven grand to go there and um, I ended up leaving within a month. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember like, I felt really ashamed because I was like, oh my God, I'm a quitter. I had to give everybody their money back and and things like that. Um, And it was kind of awkward because I was really excited to go and I raised all this money and whatever. But basically, long story short, the um, environment was just so cult-like and um, it was very toxic and manipulative. And people were like, like one story really quick is um, there was like a lot of physical healings happening. And now after studying the brain and things like that, like, yes, I believe that could happen, but they were claiming that Jesus was doing it. Not to say that that's not true. Like, sure. I think a lot of people do connect with Jesus and maybe he has something to do with it. I don't know. But um, I have a broken finger, which is like, it's still broken. And when I was there, um, everybody was like, it was the school of like 200 people. And the leaders were also my age or younger than me, which now I'm like, that is so weird. (laughs) Um, and they would be like, okay, today we're going to like do physical healings. And does anybody have anything they want to heal? And like Joe in the back would be like, I've had neck pain for seven years. Like, please God heal me or something. And I probably sound like such an asshole because I'm kind of mocking them, but it still really frustrates me. (laughs) Um, and the entire school of like 200 people would pray over this person and then we'd all stop and they'd be like, Joe, how does your neck feel? And he'd like move it around and be like, Oh my God, it's healed. And everybody would like erupt. So they prayed, they prayed over my finger a couple times and Mm. I it dev- never like got unbroken and I was like why is God not healing my like my finger and basically like what I was told was that I wasn't baptized by the spirit and I must have been holding on to some sort of sin or something like that and 
that's when my intuition, I started really getting in touch with it because I was like, for the first time, I was like, I don't believe any of this shit. And they would talk about how we need to go out and save all of these people who were sinning and committing and living these ungodly lives. And I was like, you people suck. You people are the ungodly ones, you know, and you think that you're so egotistical that we need, everybody else needs saving and everybody else needs our help when other people are doing just fine, you know? Yeah. Um, and so there was just a lot of that very much manipulative culture. And one last thing about that, when I left, um, one of my leaders was telling me that I was letting Satan win and I was going to regret it. And I was going to come back and I, she was like, you're going to come running back here. And I was like, no, I won't. <laughs> and I left and mm -hmm. have never regretted it. Um, but that really started this process of me just unlearning all of this dogma and so back to your yeah. question, I would say that spirituality comes from a direct, um, or I would, I would describe spirituality as an expression of oneself as the creator. Um, mm. And I believe that religion tells us that we need, that we're not the creator and we're these horrible beings and we need somebody to come in and save us. There's a lot of toxic, it's like one big abusive codependent relationship. <laughs> There's a lot of like yeah. mar martyrdom and stuff like that. Um, and with spirituality, I, I see myself as the creation and the creator. And I don't see God as a being outside of me. I see as myself as God. And I see the tree outside my window as God. And, um, there's, there's nothing that I need to do, or there's no behaviors that I need to do to, to access that, that innate intelligence and that innate, innate power that I have. Um, mm. so yeah, long winded answer of answering your question. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. Cause that's a, that's the same distinction. I feel like I've found a lot too, is so that if there's something outside of us that they need, there's something outside of the present moment where we should be. And that's what I find is a lot of times what is in religion is it's always outside of us. It's always something else, something other than now, than you, than the moment, than what you have within you. And so I love, I love that distinction. Yeah. Thank, yeah. I love that too. And also like, um, at least in my experience, Christianity very much makes survival responses about morality and they have nothing to do with that. And they would say, if you're anxious, I had a friend in college, um, she was so worried about me and cause I was really depressed because I had a shit ton of trauma and my mom is in a psych hospital and I was really struggling and she was like, well, she literally sat me down and she was like, well, are you, have you been reading your Bible lately? And I don't mean to mock them because they truly don't know any better, but it still doesn't mean that it's harmful. And so it becomes, it becomes a matter of bad and good and right and wrong rather than no people adapt to their environment in order to survive. And it completely just overrides um, biology and it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, and it's very powerful to create like a narrative about reality and like teach people about that. It puts people into a state of dependence and really alters your life when you are seeing your whole existence through a very strong specific lens, a very dualistic lens of right and wrong and us and them and the bad guys and the good guys that is really hard to break out of and hard to because it feels so painful and wrong to to step outside of that and so I just like props to you for moving out of that space I know how hard it is from doing it myself so thank you yeah. and props to you too because <laughs> you're right <laughs> like it is and especially with just the like the idea of I'm gonna go to hell and things like that like I'll still have that sort of fear pop up where I'm like, what if they are right? <laughs> and you know yeah. what? Yeah. Like I'm, I just sort of tell that part of myself. I'm like, I will not serve a God that, um, that believes in something like hell. Like I just don't, that's not who my God is. And yeah, that's yeah. pretty much all there is to it. So the, the hell fear is deep, especially when you've been fed it since you were a child. Like it's, it's not just like, Oh, I don't believe in that anymore. It's gone. It's like in your body, deeply programmed, and so it definitely takes a while for that to, yeah. to move on. I, I literally just felt my throat. Like I always get like a little bubble of like my throat chakra. Literally when you said that, I was like, <laughs> yeah, there it is. I can feel it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it's, real. it's a journey for sure. Um, gosh, we could talk about all these things for like millions of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, Let's touch on what we can and then move on to another giant topic. I love it. But I want to hear just a, a little bit about, um, you mentioned another thing that you talk to people a lot about is shadow work. Um, and so I'm curious, uh, to hear what, 
what that is and what people, how, how people can do that, why we should do it. Just a little bit about shadow work. So I think for me, um, shadow work is just like, just to put it like point blank is just like accessing our shadows. Um, and Mm. what our shadows are, are like the parts of us that we have deemed, um, bad or wrong. Like, for example, let's say in the context of like spirit or of in Christianity, like in that, in that world, like sexuality is very, um, shameful and demonized and especially in women and so for me like a part of my shadow work has been um, accessing that part of myself and and sort of bringing her out of an exiled state what I saw this image that I sort of get with all of my shadows if you will is that like there are parts of myself that I have been told are bad or wrong or I've even deemed themselves bad or wrong and it's almost like they're sort of hiding in a cave And um, they are like so afraid to be themselves and they're so afraid to come out because they are afraid maybe they'll go to hell or like they're afraid that their dad won't love them or they're afraid that the kids at school will make fun of them. Um, And so, yeah, I feel like it's just really um, a beautiful practice of um, there's this therapy model that I do. It's called IFS therapy. And in it, the slogan um, that a lot of people say is all parts are welcome. And so mm-hmm. it's not about shaming or trying to get rid of any parts of you or like, oh my God, I'm so anxious. I need to get rid of this. It's more so about seeing that as one of your shadows and like sort of um, letting them know that it's safe to come out of that cave. Mm, that's so beautiful. I love that so much because I always hear shadow work in the context of like, these are all the bad things that we're going to annihilate in you until you're pure and perfect. Say no. So that's like the most beautiful, (laughs) beautiful perspective of that. I love love that so much. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. And that's, again, that would be another example of toxic positivity, you know, like, um, there's this woman that I follow on YouTube. Her name is Elizabeth April and she, um, does a lot of, um, She's a channel for the Galactic Federation of Light. I don't know if you've heard of them. I've, that I've is very that. that's very woo woo and very out there, but that's like how <laughs> spiritual I am. Like I love that shit. <laughs> um, and she was just talking about the other day how like a lot of folks in the New Age community will try to be only love and light, and that actually makes them equally just as dark as the people that they're yeah. trying to shame and they're trying to not be like. Um, and so again, it goes back to the yin yang, it goes back to the, um, the masculine, the feminine, the polarities and, and realizing that there truly is nothing wrong with us. Yes, we all have things to work on and things that maybe we want to do better at and things like that. But at the end of the day, these really are like in, in biological sense, like just, or physiological, I don't even know what word is correct there. (laughs) Science is not my forte. Um, we, we've just adapted to our environment in order to survive. Um, at the end of the day, that's really all it is. So have you heard of star seeds? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> you're probably, you're probably that. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I, yeah, I would, I would consider myself a star seed and a light worker. And I just don't, I don't know what, supposedly me and my mom were talking the other day that like Palladians look like they're Nordic. And I was like, cause my mom is, and my brothers, both my brothers are blonde hair, blue eyed. And I'm definitely not. And so I don't know where I came yeah. from, but I know I'm probably not from, I definitely know I'm not from earth. Like I fucking know that I've been saying that forever. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. I, somebody came up to me. I like find myself in a lot of the woo woo circles of Los Angeles and things with people dancing and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And someone came up to me at one point and was like, "Did you know that you're Mintakin?" And I was like, "What's that?" And they're like, "It's a star seed." And I was like, "Googling what is a Mintakin?" But yeah, I love that stuff. I love all the the woo woo weirdos as long as it's not harmful me too (laughs) that's me we could talk about so much but I yeah I just feel like we could talk for days but I want to ask you some of these sort of oh well I did want to talk to you about um another huge topic that we could get into but we'll at least touch on it is like you talk a lot about body positivity and self-love and I always see your posts they're just like so amazing talking about loving our bodies as they are so I would be sad if I didn't ask you at least to touch a little bit on that yeah um so I honestly have sort of been moving away from body positivity um Hmm. I know that like 
as it was created, it was specifically, I haven't done a lot of research on it, but I've done a little bit specifically like created for marginalized folks to um, just have a space where they can celebrate their bodies. Um, people who are not white and thin and just this like very idealized version of beauty. Um, but I, at least in my experience with it, I feel like it has kind of grown into this, um, toxic space um and I promise I don't label everything as toxic like I'm very intuitive and it, it's unfortunate like there are a lot of things that are toxic in our world um at least in my experience because I feel like it still puts so much emphasis on the body and it's like like for me people telling me to just love my body and I'm like I don't like my boobs are kind of weird and to be honest like I don't really love them um and so with that I have been moving into like I love how I just said my boobs are weird. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. But, like, I do have – I think I have weird boobs. And, like, I have really broad shoulders and things that, like um, – I do, to be honest, like, I don't necessarily really love about my body. And it's not a matter of, like, forcing myself to, like, be overly positive about something that I don't necessarily feel super positive about. Um, and so I have been moving into, like, a space of body neutrality where – it's different from bo body positivity and that like body positivity is like, at least for me, like I love myself because I have nice legs or like a nice ass or like I have really full hair or whatever you want to like, um, whatever you want to say. And then body neutrality is like, I love myself. And that literally is completely separate from anything that has to do with my looks. And so, um, it's for me, it's more about like, no, like, to be honest, I don't love every part of my body, but I, I but I unconditionally accept every single part of my body. And I feel like that's the difference from body positivity because it creates a dissonance where it's like, I have to be body positive, but it's like, but does that make me bad that I don't love every part of my body? Does that make me not confident and make me an insecure person? Like, not necessarily. That means that like, like, again, yeah, like I said, I don't have to love every single part of my body, but I unconditionally accept every single part. Mm, it's like kind of tied to the whole toxic positivity thing of like trying, forcing yourself to be positive about something. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of what I've been um, moving to. But also with that, like, yeah, I do. There are times where I do don't care that I think I have weird boobs or like, yeah, my shoulders are broad, but like whatever or things like that. But then there are also times where I get really insecure about those things. And again, it's about integration and not trying to be overly positive or think my way out of it. It just, there's, um, there's an Oracle deck that I have that just popped into my head. And it talks about how sometimes we get so caught up in trying to heal our darkness. And in there, uh, it's Elena Fairchild. And she says, darkness just is like it doesn't always need to be healed. And so I think that sort mm -hmm. of ties in really beautifully with that. Yeah. Yeah. That seems to be the theme of the, the combo today. <laughs> Accepting our darkness. Yeah. That's I love that. That's actually, I hadn't heard that perspective. And so I feel like I just learned something where I, it's, I have this one friend, her name's Jamie Lee Finch and she is like a coach. Like, and wait, coach no and way. Like, do you know her? I'm, I'm, I, I literally just got into a group um, on like monthly group with her where it's like a writer's support group with like five of us. She, That's that so makes sense. funny. You would know her. Yeah, she's so rad. No, I just like thought about her because I always am telling her like she's so good at all the right words like and I always joke that that's like the millennial like thing is where like we we know all the words and all the right things and stuff and she's the friend that like I'm always learning from her okay that's what we're supposed to say now and so it's like that just made me think that I'm like okay body neutrality not body positivity because I'm like always trying to make sure I'm saying things the right way and I love that but also like for me like I if body positivity works for people then like freaking go yeah. for it like that's just me you know like I just I'm not super yeah. stoked about the body positivity thing but also it really helps a lot of other women so I'm not one to say like that it's right it's, it just depends you know yeah it's a balance I think that we should yeah we can't get too caught up in our language but at the same time we should yeah. be informed sensitive and informed on like w what we're used to saying or used to talking about that's connected to an idea that might be harmful so that's I, I feel like that's like your superpower in this world is bringing these like in unique perspectives on things like I, I'm always what I'm hearing you talk about in this conversation and what I see that you write it's always like it's like what people haven't heard yet but everybody's been feeling inside where everybody's like oh my gosh finally someone's saying what I've been feeling and you have such a talent for 
for putting words to what seems like a new unique perspective that people really needed. Thank you. Yeah. That, that like warms my heart. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's really special. Um, okay, so I want to close with some kind of they're rapid fire, but they're hard questions. So they're not really rapid fire, but they're like existential questions. So we'll go through some of those before we close out. But you, you, they're rapid fire in the sense that they can be short answers, but they're existential questions. So the first one is, what is love? Presence. Why are we here? To fulfill our mission. What is our biggest mistake as humans? Not accessing the parts of ourselves that we're afraid of. Mm, I love that. Is this real? No, it's all an illusion. It really <laughs> is. But at the same time, yes, it's so real. And at the same time, it's absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, it's both, both real and both not. I love that. Uh, do you believe in past lives? Hell yes. 1000%. I think I've literally, I, this better be my last incarnation on earth. I swear to God. <laughs> I'm and tired of this back place. To your Pleiadian, <laughs> yes. Pleiadian planet next. Have to fulfill your mission here. <laughs> um, do, wait, I skipped one. What would you reincarnate as? You just said, hopefully not on earth. <laughs> so maybe something um, else. Damn, that's a good question. Probably a bird, because I really want to fly. <laughs> yes, I love that. Um, would you want to live forever? Nope. But we also <laughs> do, because energy never dies. So, God, that's a whole yeah. other conversation. <laughs> yes. Maybe not living forever as Emma, but as uh, Yeah. Yeah. Um, do soulmates exist? Yes, but I don't think um, they have to be romantic, and I don't think it's like the movies. I don't think it's like that at all. And that's, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I like it. Uh, if you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? I would really change the wealth gaps. I would make um, everybody have as much or more than what they need. Mm. I feel like that would take a lot of folks out of survival mode. And that's pretty much yeah. like the issue to a lot of people's problems. Yeah, that would alleviate a lot of other problems I think from that what would you tell your teenage self mm. <laughs> oh man um shit's gonna be really hard but it's gonna be really beautiful <laughs> yes. the hard stuff tends to be the beautiful stuff or at least lead to it it's all mixed together yeah. um and then the last question I always ask people is if I told you that right now the whole world was listening to you and you could tell them one thing, what would you tell them? <laughs> oh, man, what the heck? Just the easiest question ever, I know. Wow. So. Um, if I could tell the whole entire world one thing right now. Oh, man, that's a really hard freaking question. Um, I love you all. <laughs> I don't know. I like can't even think of anything right now because there's so many things I'd want to say. Um, love is real. Be kind to yourself. <laughs> I don't know. That's pretty much all. I love all of you. And that was a good one. that's pretty much it. <laughs> I mean, be kind to yourself and love. Like that's that's the message. It's hard to put words to it because I feel like I want to like surround everyone with like an energy it's hard for me to know I'm like whatever words I can say that makes you feel loved well, yeah <laughs> like, absolutely well that's like that's a book <laughs> that whole question yeah. could literally be like an entire novel so yeah yeah I just love asking that because it I feel like it gets to the core of what people like what people's core message is and what we what people want to share and it's always interesting to see what people say but well, this was amazing. I feel like I could talk to you for ages. We should I like know. talk more and be like distant friends. Yes, I would <laughs> seriously love that. And if I would love to come back on here anytime. This was so fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would love to. Yeah, we should do more things together. And if you're ever in LA, if we're ever out of this crazy thing, then hit me up. Hopefully. And, Again, yeah. we don't know when it's going to end, but God, hopefully it's soon. <laughs> yeah well tell us what you have coming up where can people find more of you 
My Instagram is at Emma Zek underscore um, E M M A Z as in zebra E C K and then an underscore. Um, and then my website is www.emmazek.com. Um, and then also I'm releasing an online course, which is very exciting um, within the next like probably three to four months. So not super soon, um, but it's basically just helping women own their voice. And that's all I have to say about that. So <laughs> yeah, something to keep an eye out for. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here. It was great to have you. Thank, thank you so much. You.